Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, welcome back to the Advanced Machine Learning Lecture Series. Today we are going to start a new topic, and that's active learning. And so uh, that's quite an exciting topic because it goes in the direction of an artificial scientist learning to ask the most relevant questions. So let me jump right there. The chapter is titled Active Learning or and Optimal Experimental Design. So these are two phrases that are being used roughly for the same topic. Active learning comes more from the machine learning literature and originally even from the literature on learning by humans. So if you have a human student, maybe uh, people think it is smarter if the student can, for example, select the topics to learn next, uh, maybe the topics the student is more interested in, or maybe the topics that the student doesn't yet know so well, as opposed to just following a course that is for everyone that teaches the same topics to every student in the same way. So that's active learning for human education. And then this term got transferred to the machine learning literature. And as we will see, it's about a cl clever way, a clever way to choose training samples so that you are most efficient in your learning progress and you don't spend too much time on training samples where you already know the answers perfectly well, but instead you concentrate on those training examples where a little bit uncertain and which you have to still learn better. So that's active learning for machine learning. And then there is the phrase optimal experimental design that comes more from the field of statistics. So the idea is that you want to make an experiment, uh, experiment in one of the natural sciences that is controlled by a number of parameters, but you want to be efficient. You don't just want to try out every possible value combination of all parameters and redo the measurement, but instead you want to pick the most informative measurements to learn very quickly as much as possible about the particular physical setup, for example. So in all these cases, the goal is to be more efficient in your learning, more efficient in your discovery. And on a more general level, this is, of course, what we always strive for in science. We don't want to waste time on things that we already perfectly understand or which are boring. We want to spend time on the more interesting stuff. Okay, so to illustrate this, uh, let me first illustrate an example of active learning for neural networks. Imagine you want to train a neural network on image recognition, the usual task. So the input to the neural network would be an image. The output would be a label for that image. And you have a large data set. But now, unfortunately, most of this data set is not labeled. So the labels are missing. You can get labels simply by asking a human, but this is expensive because these are millions of images and uh, you have only a limited budget for human volunteers that are trying to label your images. And so labeling is expensive and you want to make good use of your resources. So uh, if the situation is as depicted here, you would have already learned the labels for this image, namely it's a tree, and for that image over there, namely it's a cat but all the other labels are still unknown. And the question is now, which labels should you inquire about next? Which labels do you want to learn? Which training samples do you want to look at? Now, of course, you could uh, try to pick this image, which also shows a tree. But if you want to be efficient, maybe you don't want to do this because you recognize immediately, well, that looks very close to the tree that I already know, so probably, I'm fine with my prediction there. Then there are other kinds of images. And um, for example, here you have an image of what we would know is a bus or an automobile of some sort. Um, you could inquire about that label. But if you are even smarter, 
Then you see that there are several images of an object that looks kind of similar. There are several of them, so it seems to be important, but you don't know the label yet. And so what you could do is to pick one of those examples and inquire about the label. And then you would learn, yes, this is a house. And by having learned this for one single image, you have also gained a new understanding of other images. So that's roughly the idea of being efficient and picking your training samples that have to be labeled next. In this context, the guy who's doing the labeling is called an oracle. So an oracle is something where you can ask a question and get the perfect answer. Uh, but in this setting, it costs something. It costs some money or some time. So you want to be efficient. OK, so that's active learning for neural networks, which we will discuss today. And then the second notion that is related, uh, experimental design, could be represented by this example. So here you have a physics experiment. There is, um, say, a particle here represented by this red dot, a particle that moves around and is deflected by forces, um, for example, um, electrical forces that are acting here between these metallic plates. And then it also goes through some region here in the middle of the screen where something mysterious is happening. Maybe other forces are acting that we are trying to explore. Or there is another particle in there that is exerting a certain force that we want to understand better. Or something particular we want to find out about this region. So that's, so to speak, an unknown model, an unknown physics model in this case that we want to learn something about. And we will learn something about it because the particle is deflected in one way or another by whatever happens in this region. And then finally, it will hit a screen and it will hit at a particular location, in this case here. And if it had been deflected in a different way, it would have hit at a different location. So we learn a little bit. Now, maybe there is also some noise. So there's some stochasticity. And even if I keep all the conditions unchanged, it will um, hit the screen at slightly different spots. So I have to collect statistics. Now, I do not just need to passively observe this deflected particle and its statistics, but instead there are measurement settings. So in this example, I could imagine that there are voltages that I apply to these metal plates. These control the forces and the deflection of the path of the particle. And so it uh, controls in which way the particle flies through this mysterious region in the middle of the picture, and in which way it is uh, later also deflected before it hits the screen. And so these voltages help me, so to speak, to change the kind of question that I'm trying to answer, that I'm trying to interrogate. And so the overall setting would be that I pick some measurement settings, I observe some measurement result. I learn a little bit, only a tiny little bit, maybe about my unknown physics model, about some unknown parameters inside this physics model. And then I will go on and change my measurement settings in order to learn even more. And I want to be smart about it. I want to not stay too much with settings that are boring, but I want to pick settings that will reveal the maximum of new information about this unknown physics model. And so you see, this is really how science uh, operates. You should be smart in asking your questions. You should not just sweep through all po uh, possible measurement settings and record all the measurement results. That's probably much too much information. And you can imagine that maybe every experimental run is expensive, or at least it costs a lot of time. So uh, it's good to be smart. OK. So these are the settings. Um, I want to pick the most informative training sample, or I want to pick the most informative measurement that I can do. So is this general setting clear? I think so. So uh, let me move on then and let us discuss 
active learning and supervised training. So I'm thinking here of, uh, for example, neural network training or potentially other models. Um, we haven't really discussed that much other machine learning models, but there are simpler models than neural network. So it doesn't really depend on that. What I imagine is I have a model that tries to take an input X, which again could be an image and maps this input to some output, to some prediction, which here I might call Y, or maybe I even uh, indicate that this is the prediction instead of the true Y that belongs to this particular input X. And then this model should be learnable, it should be trainable, so it will have parameters, again, which I call theta. Okay, and so the setting we have in mind is really supervised training, so there is a large set of possible inputs X, uh, some of which are labeled with the true Y, many of which are not yet labeled, and we want to have the smartest way of uh, picking the next X to be labeled. Um, but we can also do much more complicated stuff. Uh, we could uh, think of a situation where I have, say, many reinforcement learning scenarios which are represented by X, and then I uh, check how well I can train a reinforcement learning agent and improves its performance in any given scenario. And I maybe want to pick the scenario that is most likely to give me a good improvement of the performance. So you can really go far beyond supervised training. But, but let's stick with supervised training for the moment. And let's illustrate the basic situation again. So this is the situation that I had depicted before with the many images and many are not labeled. So let's depict this again. I have a large, large pool of data and many are unlabeled. So if they're unlabeled, I will have an open circle and some are labeled. These are these filled circles. So I have this set of labeled and unlabeled data. And um, the way I place them in this plane is, of course, a little bit arbitrary. You understand if these are images, they are high dimensional. Each, uh, each, um, each sample here is a high dimensional vector. So uh, even just to draw them in the plane is already an abstraction. So our goal is that we want to pick somehow the most promising or informative sample where we want to query the label among all unlabeled samples. So let's say maybe it's this one that our algorithm will select for us. And that's the most informative one. And one of the things we will have to discuss is what do we even mean by most informative? What is the best uh, training sample to label? So we want to query our oracle for the label of this sample. And sometimes I will call this sample X star. So that's the particular one that we pick. So this is a situation that is known as pool-based active learning. You have a large pool of data, much of which is unlabeled. There's also another version I should mention, which is stream-based. So that's basically constantly you get new samples that are unlabeled and Every time you have to decide, do I want this labeled or do I not need this label? So you have to design 
you have to decide on what is called an online setting. So you don't have too much time. You have to say, now, do I need a label or not? So that's another version of things. OK, so now our goal is a strategy to pick this best X star sample. And what can the strategy be based on? Well, right now we have a model that has been trained on the previous labeled samples. So that is given, we can exploit that. And of course, we have all the previous data. In principle, we have access to uh, the previous labels that are already known, and of course, also to the larger pool of unlabeled data. And um, what we want to optimize is learning success. I will say something about that in a moment. But what is very important in this scenario is to understand what we consider expensive and what we don't consider expensive. What is expensive is to get the labels. Getting the labels is expensive, but it's not expensive to get the predictions of your model. You can easily run the model, or at least so the thinking goes in this scenario, on many of the unlabeled samples in order to figure out uh, whether it's very certain about its prediction, for example. So that's important. If you change anything here, then of course you will also end up with different strategies. So what do we mean by optimizing the learning success? Well, um, if, for example, it's an image classification task, one measure of success is the accuracy. So we could have an image like this. I would measure the accuracy, which just says, compare the predictions against the true label and note how many times you are correct and express this in a percentage. But we want to measure in the ideal case, the accuracy on all of the data, all of the allowable data. Now, when we do this thing, of course, maybe that's not really possible, but that's at least conceptually what we have in mind. So if I were to measure this on all the data, how should things look like? Well, the one thing I know is that um, even if I don't do anything particularly smart and I just train on more and more samples of this data set, I should get better and better. Yeah? So if, to the right, I will plot the number of training samples that I have already labeled and on which I have already trained. Okay. And so um, as I look at more and more labeled training samples and I train my neural network, of course I must get better. So as I go on, I will probably go up and eventually if my neural network is powerful enough, I will reach something relatively close to 100%. Now this is say for a strategy where we picked the next training example to be labeled at random. I will still get better because as I pick more and more random training samples, I cover a larger and larger fraction of the total data, so I must become better. The hope now is that with active learning, you become better faster. So you would then have a curve that is much more steep and goes like this. Of course, it also will not exceed 100%. So 
eventually the difference uh, will shrink, but uh, at intermediate times, there will be a big difference. So that would be the hope for a good active learning strategy. And so you can then uh, look at this in several ways. Um, you can say, I want to invest a certain number of training samples, which is not too big because they are expensive to label. And I go up to here and then I see there's a big difference between the two strategies. Or you could say, no, I want to reach a certain accuracy level because I want to be reliable. And I ask how many training samples I needed for this. So I could say, um, uh, the accuracy level is good enough. And then the active learning strategy would already hit that level here, whereas the random strategy would hit, hit it much later. So these are the two ways you can look at this. Okay, so far so good. The question is how to go about it. Um, and there is a conflict here between approaches that are conceptually very good, but super expensive and hard to implement, and other approaches that are very simplistic conceptually, uh, but actually work quite well in practice and they're quite uh, efficient. And so the most popular approach is very simple, namely among all these unlabeled examples to pick the one where the current model has the biggest uncertainty. So assuming you have a way to judging how uncertain your model is on any given unknown training sample, in its prediction, you want to pick the one with the largest uncertainty. And that seems to work surprisingly well. So the idea is to pick the X, the sample with the largest uncertainty of the model prediction. And that immediately, of course, raises the question, okay, but how do I have access to the uncertainty of my model prediction? So how to estimate this? And the answer really depends. It depends very much on what you're looking at. It's a little bit harder if you have a regression task where you try to predict a continuous values, but it's comparatively easy for a classification task because of the way that we often train classification tasks. So you remember that in a typical image classification task, we would have an image and we send it through a neural network, for example, a deep convolutional neural network. And then we make it such that the output neurons of the neural network correspond to the different class labels. So we would have several outputs. If there are 100 different categories of objects, there would be 100 neurons in the output. And then the value of the output neuron is large if the neural network thinks, oh yes, it's this category. For example, there will be a cat neuron and a dog neuron and so on. And for each of those, I will get a prediction between zero and one.
And so um, the way we often do this technically is, of course, uh, we apply a softmax operation in the last layer so that ensures that the output is between zero and one and the sum over all output neurons is also one. So it's normalized and it looks like a probability distribution. So uh, it's easy to think we might want to interpret it as a probability distribution. And that's the basis of this approach, because once you interpret it as probabilities, they also tell you something about your uncertainty. So um, you would then say in this interpretation that the probability under the given model, so theta, the parameters of the neural network, the probability that the true label is L given the image is X is just the output of the neural network at this uh, label position L. So L is the index here and uh, you take the output of the neural network and pick it at neuron position L. So uh, that's your interpretation. It's so to speak, the conditional probability, if I observe the image, uh, the probability that the true label would be L is maybe given by the network output. Now, I will say a little bit more about this in a moment. It's not immediately always clear that this is actually true, but it, it does become true in the long time limit after good training, if you train with the categorical cross entropy. So um, let me note this down. Uh, so the categorical cross entropy is basically back Leibler divergence between the true uh, distribution for any given sample and the distribution output by the neural network. And so if, the, if there is only one true label, what this means is I evaluate the model distribution at the true label, take the log, and average this over all x in the data set. And if this um, loss function is minimized after a lot of training, then the uh, conditional probability given by the model, so the model output, really converges to the conditional probability uh, that is in the data set. Okay, so if this is all true, and we will say a little bit more about this in a moment, uh, then it's easy enough to evaluate the uncertainty. Because if you have a probability distribution and one of the probabilities is one and the, other, the others are zero, obviously there is no uncertainty. It's perfectly certain. On the other hand, if you have two of the entries, each of which is half the probability, well, then you're maximally uncertain between these two options. So now it becomes easy to implement this idea of picking the sample with the biggest uncertainty. So you could pick the image X with somehow the biggest uncertainty. Again, now you have to be more specific. What does it mean? And there are variations on this team, on this scheme. So for example, you could say, I have a probability distribution the entropy of this probability distribution is a good measure of the uncertainty of how spread out is my probability distribution. So you could say, I'm looking for the X with the maximum entropy of this probability distribution that is the output of my neural network. Yeah, and preferring those images X where the probability distribution is very spread out. You could also have other ways of uh, judging your uncertainty. Because in the end, when you're trying to make concrete classification predictions, you will typically do this. You go through the probability distribution and you pick 
the one entry that has the biggest probability and you say, this is my prediction. If you are not allowed to give probabilistic predictions, but you have to select one, then this will be your prediction. And so then you could say, well, it would be perfect if this is 100% probability, but if my best prediction, that is the entry with the largest probability, has only 30% probability, then apparently I'm not so certain because there's a lot of probability weight uh, in the other labels. So that's something that you could check out. Um, the large uncertainty here corresponds to a small value of the maximum probability. So you maximize your probability over all labels and then you check out all the possible images X and see where this one um, is smallest. Okay. And then there is a third way that people have come up with. They say, oh, I'm not so interested in what's the smallest value because maybe one of these categories is 30% and all this is, this seems bad, but all the others are only 2% because there are so many labels. And then I'm still fairly certain that this is the correct entry. It would be much worse if I had one of them 20% and the other 22%. So if I have two labels that are very close by in their probability values. And so you could say, what's the smallest difference between the two largest probabilities? And that even has a name, it's called margin sampling. So it's the margin, uh, the difference between these two. Okay. So this is uncertainty sampling and it works surprisingly well. So it is often, even if you try to invent more elaborate techniques for active learning, it's taken as a sort of benchmark because it works so well. And what it means in plots like this one is that you get something like um, say a 30% or so uh, reduction of the training time needed for a certain accuracy. Of course, that depends very much on the data set and everything, uh, but these are typical numbers. So you cannot typically expect a factor of 10 reduction in active learning, uh, but you can expect some sizable reduction. And if you think that every label costs you some amount, then maybe even that is worth it. Okay, so that's uncertainty sampling. Now, two, two remarks still about uncertainty sampling. Coming back to what I said before, is the, or two remarks about uncertainty sampling based on the output of the neural network in a classification task, because I told you already, it's not so clear immediately whether the output that is normalized like a probability distribution should be interpreted as a probability distribution. Think of the start of the training progress. At the start of training, the output for any image is just random. It depends on how the weights of your neural network were initialized. And because it's random, just by random luck, you might get something where one of the probabilities is very large and all the others are small. And you think, oh, here I'm very certain I don't need to train on this anymore. But of course it's wrong. So uh, in that case, at the start of the training, you don't at all have a true measure of uncertainty. You can get a little bit around this by making sure that you initialize your weights such that automatically all the resulting probabilities in your output are of the same size. So it's a very spread out distribution. So the distribution looks uh, even initially a little bit like this. And you can arrange this if you make sure that since this is a softmax operation that the values that enter this operation uh, are basically around zero, fluctuating around zero. And again, you can ensure this if the weights connecting you to the 
layer below that are uh, initialized to be very small. So there are ways to make sure that initially you start from an output that really indicates maximum uncertainty, and then maybe it's, um, it's better. Now, I already remarked that later on, it will be okay. Later on, it will be okay because if you train with this categorical cross entropy, you're really trying to mimic the probability that is obtained from the actual data. And let me give you an example to make it really clear what's going on here. So imagine again, you have your image X, you run it through your neural network classifier, and maybe there are only three categories. So one of them is tree, I like trees, I guess. And one of them is red car, and the other is blue car. Now, um, imagine just for the sake of the argument that for some stupid reason, the neural network, which may be a convolutional neural network, in principle receives all the different color channels of the images, but the weights are arranged initially in such a way that it drops color information and only keeps the black and white information. So what would happen? And this is a nice example. So at first, the neural network that operates in this way would easily learn the difference between a tree and the cars, because you don't really need the color information to, to, to learn this. But then with respect to the cars, it, it simply has no chance if it does not look at the color information unless there would be a unless there is a correlation between the shape of a car and the color, which I think there is not. And so what the neural network in this initial stage would then learn is to give me an output that just corresponds whenever it sees a car, it will give me an output that corresponds to the percentages of red and blue cars that are seen in the training set because it tries to mimic these probabilities. So it would, uh, for example, give me, I don't know, 30% um, red cars and 70% blue cars. So if we have the situation in the training data set and the neural network gets an input, of a car, it drops all the color information and that it has nothing left. And the best it can do in order to minimize the categorical cross entropy loss is simply to, over a long training time, approximate this distribution that you also find in the data set, 30% red, 70% blue, okay. So this is what will happen. But then of course, if it does the active learning, it will recognize that for the trees, it's very certain. Yeah? So whenever it sees a picture of a tree, there's a 100% um, probability for the tree and that's perfect. Whereas whenever it sees a car, it has this 30% versus 70%, so it's less certain. So it will then concentrate its active learning on images that show cars. So it will ask for labels for these cars. And eventually, hopefully, it will adapt its weights such that the uh, color info is actually retained. And then with the help of this color info, it will also eventually be able to distinguish between the red and the blue cars. And then if you feed it a red car, it will have a 100% probability for red car. And if you feed it a blue car, it will have 100% probability for a blue car. So this is how you should think uh, about this. Um, if, if for some reason it drops the essential information, then the best it can do is just to mimic the a probability in the data set, given the information that it does retain, in this case, just car, uh, but this involves some uncertainty and active learning would guarantee that it concentrates on those cases and learns it better and eventually also keeps the relevant information and then um, it really becomes very certain. Okay. So this is uh, some remarks about um, uncertainty sampling for the case of classification. There's the case of regression. Regression is instead of having these categorical labels, you want to output just a number or a set of numbers, a vector. 
And then in the standard neural network training pipeline, we do not know the uncertainty. The network outputs just a number, but there is no way you can interpret this number in terms of an uncertainty. So different from the classification task. And so we will see later uh, what can be done there, uh, in particular uh, using Bayes ansatz. Uh, but that will come a little bit later. What we now discuss next is, unless there are some questions, what we now discuss next is something that is a very general way to estimate uncertainty, even if the model output itself does not tell you anything about uncertainty. So for example, for regression tasks, there's no way that the output can be interpreted in terms of uncertainty. So if you have no direct estimate of uncertainty, what do you do? And so there is a very old and tested technique that is surprisingly simple and always works. And that is just to have many models, not only one, but multiple models. And there is a funny name for that. It's a committee of models. It's like a committee of judges. And so the idea is you have a neural network number one. And if you feed in the image, it says, I don't know, dog. You have a neural network number two which has also been trained on this data set, but maybe in a slightly different way, I will say something in a moment. And it outputs cat. And maybe there is a network number three, and it also outputs cat. And so as a result, you would say the majority wins, and my real prediction is cat. So that's the first way you can use these models to improve predictions by having majority voting. But for our purpose, it's also important that you get a measure of the uncertainty. Because in this case, apparently you're a little bit uncertain because at least one of the models says something different from the rest. Whereas if all of them were to say cat, then you are apparently more certain. Now, where do you get these different models from? Well, you train several models. For example, starting from slightly different initial conditions. And initial conditions here mean different values of the parameters, so different values of the weights and biases in the neural network. And you train from these initial conditions, theta, for the different models. And you will see that the uh, training, even on the same data set, even on the same training samples, will not end up in the same network and will not end up making exactly the same predictions, at least initially, maybe eventually everything will converge. So that's your committee. Uh, maybe you also train them on different pieces of the data set. That's another alternative and is even better because then you even eliminate the biases that are introduced by picking only a particular part of the data set. It's also of course more expensive because then you need a larger number of training samples. And so now, once you have this committee of models, it's clear that you can estimate the uncertainty from looking at the output. And so um, you would pick the X with a maximum disagreement between the models. And uh, now we can look at the different tasks. Let's, in this case, let's start with regression. You could say my average prediction for this particular X is just I take all the models. Theta J is now the parameters for model number J. And I average. And then I uh, can 
get an empirical estimate for the variance if I like. So I could lo uh, look at something like this, sum over all j, f theta j of x minus this average. And that would be an estimate for the variance. And this is, so to speak, the uncertainty. And I will pick the x that maximizes this uncertainty. Okay, so that's one way to use such a committee of models for regression. Um, classification, classification. Again, each model may make its own prediction, which in this case, again, could be a probability distribution. So P theta J of label given in input, given the image. And again, I could uh, average this if I like. And I get something like an average distribution. And now I could do many things, but one of the things that people have looked at is they have said, oh, let me measure the deviation between this average probability from all the models together and the individual, um, individual um, probability distributions. For example, using the kullback leibler divergence, and I would sum maybe over all the models. And again, this is something uh, that I want to maximize, maximize the disagreement. And there would be many other ways to, to check uh, these things. Okay, so that's a committee of models, also very popular. So all of that was still uncertainty sampling, which is somehow the simplest method. But of course, it's very heuristic. So let me go back. Um, it's very heuristic. So among all the unlabeled samples, you just query the model, query your model for every of these unlabeled samples and try to estimate the uncertainty of the model in the ways we discussed. And you pick the one where it's most uncertain. But maybe it's not what you want because maybe there are some of these samples which are uh, which where you are very very uncertain indeed but they are somehow outliers they are atypical and you are uncertain because the model doesn't work very well for these outliers but they are also not very important because many of the other samples look very different and so you will actually not gain very much uh, from looking at these particular samples and uh, maybe your model will not even change very much so um, it's a question of whether sampling for uncertainty alone is always the best thing. And so there are now a little bit more principled approaches, which I want to discuss next. Aha, yeah, there's a good question. Um, so here, why did I divide by n minus one? This is just the usual trick. If you, if you have a set of random numbers, n random numbers that you empirically estimated, and uh, you want to estimate the variance in this manner, then it, um, in order to get an unbiased estimator for the variance, actually there has to be a denominator n minus one. If you were to pick one over n, then you would underestimate the variance. And the reason you underestimate it is that this F bar is also obtained from the empirical samples and is not fixed and so it always tends to be a bit closer to the empirical samples than the actual mean value. And so to correct for this, so to speak, but you can also work it out, there's the n minus one. It's not very important. If, if the n is large, it would never be important. But since in such a committee of models, we, we may not have that many, we may not have that many, uh, I thought I'd write it down. Yeah. Okay, so that's... Uh, just usual statistics. Okay, so let me move on from uncertainty and introduce the so-called expected model change. So here, this is the first time we imagine that suppose I were to train 
on the sample X, if I pick the sample as the next sample, suppose I were to train on it, what would happen? And this is the kind of question that we will also ask later again and again. Suppose I pick X and get some result Y for my label, and I train my model and I update it, how large would the update be? What would be the change? What would be the consequence? So it's asking a hypothetical question. So if we have a training sample that is X and Y, so now this is the true label. Then we know how to do gradient descent, right? So we would say, uh huh, my theta parameters of my model should be updated by minus the gradient of the loss times some learning rate eta. So the gradient of the loss is this one. And in this case, if I only think of a single training example, uh, I would imagine that I have uh, a loss that only depends on this one. So uh, as an example, it could be the mean squared error. So L theta in this notation now here would be the square deviation between the model output and the, and the particular Y. That's for mean squared error loss. And so now you could get, you could come up with the idea that you pick the X where the change in theta is largest, where the change in the model is largest. So theta is usually a vector of many parameters. So uh, we say the norm of this update is largest. But now we have a problem because um, obviously things do depend on why. Why is the true label? But of course, I don't know the true label. If I did know the true label for all those possible training samples X, then I would be finished. Then the active learning task is no, no longer relevant. So the question is, how to fix this, how to get this estimate of the typical update of the model, delta theta, without knowing why. Yeah, so we don't have the true labels. And the idea here is that you ask your model, you try to figure out from your model, um, what are the typical fluctuations in the predicted label Y. And then of course that gives you a way to estimate these things. So you would say, let me look at this gradient. Let me take the norm of this and let me average this. But instead of Y being the true label, which I don't know, I say Y is distributed according to the, my according to my model. Now, again, this means that your model must output some uncertainty. So it could be this um, classification task where the output is, again, a probability distribution. That's nice. If it is not, then you have to have other ways of estimating your uncertainty. So it runs a little bit under the same stuff. But if we have this, then I want to search for the X that maximizes this function, and that would be the one where I want to query for my label, because on average, I expect this will have the biggest influence on my model. Okay. Now, of course, this is already more expensive, as you can imagine, I have to calculate this gradient. And again, I have to do this for any potential X, this on any potential training sample X, which is in the unlabeled pool. So uh, that's um, expensive. The other remark here is, um, well, even if theta changes a lot, how do I know that this improves my model by a lot? That's not so clear. 
Also remember that the uh, gradient as written down here actually does depend on my parametrization of theta. We discussed this when we discussed natural gradients repeatedly. So there's all kinds of questions here. But in particular, uh, this theta change does not really predict the model improvement. And so that's the next step that we say, what we are really interested in is how my model improves after I train on a particular sample. So I'll still write down the problem again, delta theta itself is not directly related to the performance improvement. It's a part of it, but it's not everything. And so the idea is to ask for this performance improvement. And so the idea would be to maximize the error reduction. Now we have to say which error and what exactly do we do? Um, but first of all, Again, I do not know the true labels, the true outcomes that I will get when I ask for labels. And of course, the error reduction does depend on what are these outcomes. So the best I can hope for if I don't yet have access to these true labels is to get a measure of the expected error reduction, again, averaging over a probability distribution of potential outcomes. Okay, but we still have to answer the question, which error? I mean, the naive approach would be to say, well, I'm training on this training example in order to decrease the error on this training sample. So maybe that's the error that should be improved or decreased very much. But this is not really what we are after, because then we could just concentrate on one example and drive the error to zero, but this wouldn't really help us very much. So uh, what we are really interested in is an estimate for the overall error on the whole data set, the so-called generalization error. So if I then apply it to completely unseen samples, um, what would be the error like, and does it reduce very much if I pick this or that training sample? And again, there are multiple options here. Um, so for example, we could pick the unlabeled uh, set as a stand-in for the, as a stand-in for the, for the whole data set. And we try to estimate how much does the error reduce on this unlabeled set. And again, of course, we do not know the labels on this unlabeled set. So we have to estimate this error reduction with the help of the model itself. And again, I will give an example here. I pick classification. So let's see. So um, I could, for example, say, let me pick the probability distribution of the labels given X for any X out of the unlabeled set. So I will now call this X tilde. And let me measure the entropy of this probability distribution in order to measure the uncertainty. And I will be asking for the maximum reduction in this entropy. Now, this is um, to be averaged over the whole unlabeled data set. Yeah. 
it tells me, yeah, how bad am I doing? Um, how confident am I in these predictions on the unlabeled data set? But importantly, I'm not using the current model here, which sort of would be almost like a little bit like looking for uncertainties or so, but I'm using an updated model and I will indicate it in the following way. I say, it's the model that I would get if I train on the sample X uh, with label Y. So that's the theta I get after the training update, after a hypothetical training update. If I feed into my training algorithm a new sample, which is X and Y. Okay. And so I would hope that for the particular X that I choose and the corresponding Y, this entropy averaged over the full unlabeled set is reduced as much as possible. Now there comes the old question again, I do not know the why, I do not know the true, true label. So what I have to do is here, yeah, I have to average again over all possible values of this new label according to my model, because that's the only thing I have. So there's another average out here. So, okay, this is getting of hand. So Y is distributed according to my model. Okay, so a little bit similar to before, um, but um, again, I'm asking for a hypothetical training update and what would happen to my uncertainty under this hypothetical training update. And then I want that this whole thing is minimized. So I want to pick the X that would be able to minimize this average entropy, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So it's a long expression, but uh, you see what you're doing. Um, you imagine to pick some X, you imagine that there will be an outcome Y, but you take the model distribution for estimating this. And then you see how much the model improves on the whole unlabeled data set once you do this training update under this hypothetical new sample. Of course, here you already see that this will be very expensive, yeah, because you have to test out every X that is possible. And for each X, you have to average over the whole, in this case, over the whole unlabeled set or a fraction of the unlabeled set. Okay, so that is one case. So the error reduction on the unlabeled set, which we have available. Uh, we could also do something else. We could set aside a kind of validation set for which we do know the true labels, which is maybe not very large. And we could also always estimate the loss on that validation set. So we would uh, look at, again, the expected uh, generalization error as estimated from a validation set. So this validation set is labeled and it has been set aside for this purpose. It's not used for the training. And we would say, for example, let me calculate the loss um, averaged over the validation set. So X tilde and Y tilde, they are from the labeled validation set. But this loss, of course, does depend on my model. And it's not the original model that I pick, but the updated model under the hypothetical um, training sample X comma Y, just like before, just like a moment ago. And again, just like before, I will average this over our possible Y, which I don't know. So I uh, again, take my model. And I want to minimize this obviously. So I want to pick the X that would make this minimum. 
So again, uh, imagine you were to train on X with some Y according to the model, and then you estimate the average loss on the whole validation set and see by how much it decreases, and you want it to decrease as much as possible. And this is the X that you pick because this is the X, this is the training example that probably will give you the biggest reduction in the loss. This is basically, okay, that's a good question. This is basically a step towards categorizing the images among themselves and choose the one with the largest set, right? Um, not quite, I would say. It has to do with it. So if, um, if all of the classification predictions are equally uncertain in the beginning, then of course you should train on a sample that belongs to the largest cluster, so to speak. So if there are many houses in your training set and you still don't know what is the correct label for houses, then you should concentrate on learning houses. But eventually, of course, um, you have become better in some of the categories. And then it's a kind of balance between how bad you are doing and how big is the cluster uh, of such uh, examples in the data set. Yeah, so what you say is part of it. Okay, good. So um, what we have introduced now is basically what we want. Yeah, we want to reduce the loss. We want to pick the training example that is most likely to reduce the loss the most, but it's also extremely expensive. So this expected error reduction, this expected generalization error rejection is really the most expensive thing to do. And it's so expensive because, well, in all the methods, you're already going through all the potential candidate unlabeled samples X. That's always part of the game. Maybe you want to pick only a fraction, but anyway, that's part of the game. You want to compare them and pick the best one. That's always true. But here, in addition, you have to estimate the potential change in the loss on some, say, validation set. So the effort is, so to speak, squared. Yeah? So we have have to go through all the X and through all the X tilde here. So um, that's actually not very used that much. Okay, so we started with uncertainty sampling and then we saw even there, there are different variations. And then we saw that in principle, you want to have the expected error reduction. Now, going back to, to the beginning, our goal here is to find a strategy. We have already seen a general set of techniques that are good for finding strategies. And this is obviously reinforcement learning. So people have started to try out reinforcement learning for this problem of active learning. It's not easy in terms of setting up the right training scenario and the right state and action space and so on. But let me just give you a glimpse of what people are trying these days. So this is all quite fresh research. So what's the setting? Uh, again, um, we have an agent. And so to speak, our environment Now, this environment is quite interesting because on the one hand, it consists of all those labeled and unlabeled samples.
But you could also say it consists of the model of the classifier, for example, that we have at the current moment. And so now the agent can observe these things in some way. And it has to act and the action consists in recommending some sample at which you want to train. So that's the sample to be labeled and then it is part of the labeled samples and you train the model on it and then the environment has changed and the loop continues. So um, what would be the reward? What would be a good reward? Well, you could set aside a test set and after several steps, you measure the accuracy of your model on this test set. after a fixed number of steps. Or else um, you could also say, no, I'm interested only in um, reaching a certain accuracy and I want to know what is the number of steps that I need to reach this accuracy. So either way in principle works. Now the catch here is that you have to repeat this thing for many, you have to repeat the whole game for many data sets, obviously. It is not enough if you try to train only on one data set. That would be like playing a game once and collecting only one trajectory and only one reward uh, for your agent. That's not how reinforcement learning works. So reinforcement learning works by playing the game many, many times in slightly different settings. And so also here, you would have to create maybe artificially many different data sets, maybe they are pieces of a larger data set, and run the agent uh, in this way again and again so it can learn something. Okay. And so, um, the question is now how to do this, how to do this, especially in a way that the strategy which the agent learns is not very much dependent on the details of the data set. Uh, you might imagine that, for example, one data set has images of one format and the other has images of another format, or it's not even images, it is sounds and so on. And it would be good to have an active learning agent that generalizes across these different data sets. And uh, this is something that people have looked into. Um, it has some success, um, but it needs some ideas. So we want to find a strategy that works also for other data sets with new formats. So that means the agent should not really access the individual samples as such. Um, and the idea that some researchers had some time ago was that the, um, the state is encoded in such a way that it does not rely on the format of the samples, but only, let's say, if you want to train a classifier on the predictions of the classifier. So you would have something like this. Um, imagine here you have the probability of the um, of the label. Maybe there's the label is only binary, or maybe there's the probability of the best label or, or of the true label as a function of input, and you evaluate it on some validation set. And then this probability can sometimes reach a one, so 100%, and then it reaches also smaller values for different entries in this validation set and so on. 
So uh, the idea would be to order all these probabilities. And so what this then results in is a vector, obviously, that can be used as a state input to an agent, which somehow indicates the amount of uncertainty. So if these probabilities are always around 50%, apparently things are really bad. If uh, some of these uh, probabilities are really high, then things are getting better. So it is, it's giving some idea of the progress. Now, what are the actions? And again, there would be many choices. So the ultimate action is of course to pick um, the X star that you want to look at. Uh, but what uh, people suggested to do is that for each unlabeled sample X, you get such an action value You calculate X from using a neural network, using a, so to speak, agent policy neural network uh, from the prediction of the model, which may teach you something about the uncertainty or anything like this, and also other quantities. These could include, for example, the distance uh, to the nearest already labeled uh, samples. So you see a little bit of engineering is going on here, but these are all, and so the important thing is, these are all entries that are not sensitive to the particular format of the data set. You can do this for various data sets and therefore the agent then can generalize. And so the idea is then in the end, you pick the X with the highest score, so to speak, with the highest A. Okay, so you then have an agent that is fairly general that tries to figure out how well it is doing and tries to calculate from the predictions of the model uh, for each possible sample, something like an action score and then pick the X with the highest score. And there's probably much room for improvement uh, in order to um, bring in more information about the samples. For example, you could also look at how was your previous performance, how the model predictions have evolved over time. This could be another thing that you could uh, inject as information into your agent. So it's still ongoing. Um, uncertainty sampling is still the most simple efficient method, uh, but uh, methods are improving. Okay, so let me see. Ah, yeah, very good question. Normally we train on batches. So far we are looking at finding a sample. Could we create a batch of candidate training samples? Uh, that's a very good question. So um, now in an active learning scenario, you could argue argue that maybe every sample which you want to label is extremely expensive yeah in which case you really should first get the label for one sample and then update your model and do anything else because now you have new information and then you have to think again so then it would be good to not get a full batch of uh, samples labeled but in other cases it could really be true as you say that it's maybe less expensive if you say, oh, please label this batch of 10 samples for me. Uh, and then you would uh, do this. Um, then it becomes difficult. I don't know what's the current state of the art there because what you could do easily, that would be the simplistic method, would be to say, um, whenever I optimize any of these criteria for picking the next X, I um, optimize something like the generalized error reduction and so on. And um, the score that I get by looking at how much I reduce the error, I evaluate for each X. And then instead of just taking the best one, I could take the 10 best ones. But so this would be easy enough to do. And then this would be my batch. But it doesn't seem to be the most efficient thing because 
maybe these are all very close by samples that have much in common and maybe it's just a waste of resources to query for all of their labels. Maybe if you already know that you pick the first one, you want to pick the second one, which is relatively far apart. So these are considerations that must enter. So it's actually not, um, not entirely straightforward to work on batches. Okay, good. So let's move on. We still have 10 minutes, so that's great. Um, I want to move from active learning, which was about training models, training neural networks from some data set. I want to move on to something that is related, but still a little bit different, and namely Bayesian optimal experimental design. And the main difference, the way I'm phrasing it here is that the X that entered is no longer restricted to a discrete choice of possible given data samples as in the previous active learning, but uh, can maybe range continuously over many possible values. So that's a little bit the idea. And so let me make this clear. Uh, we have, again, a model. There's always a model. Um, and now for, for reasons that will become clear in a moment, I will now call the model parameters lambda. The reason is that we used lambda when we discussed Bayes. So I want to stick to that notation. And also when you apply these approaches, sometimes you approximate parts of it using neural networks, and then there would be a lambda, but there would also be a theta. These are the parameters of the neural network that you use to approximate uh, something. So uh, different things. Okay. So imagine you have the probability to observe a measurement result Y given a choice of measurement settings X. So uh, let me write this down. So these are the measurement settings, like a voltage you choose in an experiment or a velocity you choose for a particle in an experiment. Something that you can control. It can be a vector, of course, also. Um, now, capital Y, I use as the random variable, capital Y of X is the random variable that describes the measurement with settings X. Okay, and now why the little y is the concrete result that we get and that we're interested in. So there's always this uh, careful notation in statistics where you distinguish between the random variable and the actual values that it takes. And so, um, even more carefully, I would maybe write something like capital Y of X equals little y and capital lambda, random variable lambda equals uh, little lambda, but okay, don't want to overdo it. And so the idea is just as I uh, described before. So I would have, um, maybe I want to put up a new slide. I would have, um, choice of my measurement setting. That's my measurement setup. And it spits out some uh, result Y. And this result may be probabilistic. It may be stochastic to some degree, but also inside my measurement setup or inside my experiment, actually, I should call this an experiment, is the set of parameters lambda, which I don't know about and which I want to learn.
And so that's my goal, to learn as efficiently as possible via the measurements and via the experiments I can do the true value of lambda. And so um, just as an example, to, to make it really clear in a physics case, um, imagine a very simple mechanical model where I have a harmonic oscillator and a particle. The particle can oscillate back and forth. Its coordinate I call Q. And then the equation of motion, you know, would be the acceleration equals minus the frequency squared minus maybe some damping. In this case, again, there are many ways to phrase this, but I could say that my lambda is both the frequency and the damping. I want to figure out the frequency and the damping. I could say that the X that I choose, again, that could be many different things, but it could be the initial conditions. It could be the value of the coordinate at time zero and the value of the velocity at time zero, if I can control those. And then the Y is, so to speak, can again be many things, but maybe I'm able to measure, try to measure the coordinate at the final time after this runs for some time, the dynamics. Plus some noise, some measurement noise. Okay. And then um, it's clear what the situation is. So there would be some uh, final value of Q for a given selection of initial conditions and a given value for the frequency and for the damping. And I would add to that, so to speak, the noise. So the probability of getting uh, for this particular initial conditions, this particular outcome, uh, given these particular frequencies and damping constants, uh, would look like this, for example, if it's a Gaussian distribution for, for some reason. Yeah? So I would, um, I would run the dynamics for some time. This is time, that is Q. I would run the dynamics for some time. It will be a decaying oscillation. And then I stop it. And at this time, I take a measurement, but the measurement doesn't reveal quite exactly the coordinate, but it scatters around the true coordinate. And this is why I get uh, this probability distribution. Okay. And so I run this many times and I can change my initial conditions so as to learn as quickly as possible about the true underlying frequency and true underlying damping constant. So at least that should make it clear what we want to do. And so what we then will discuss next time is how we would of course use Bayes the way we learned it to update our knowledge of the world once we make such a measurement. And then the trick will be that the next time we make a measurement, we carefully choose the X such that given all possible hypothetical outcomes of the measurement, uh, on average, we get the biggest information gain. So the biggest reduction on average in the entropy of my distribution of the unknown parameters lambda. So that will be the basic idea. Okay, and so you can see from this, it models very nicely the way a good scientist should do their experiments, not just taking many data, but carefully choosing the conditions that one can control in order to learn as much as possible. Okay, so any questions still? Aha, an organizational question. Do you plan on providing some kind of test exam? I guess that concerns the Erlangen students. Uh, that's a good question. I guess I should. I haven't yet <laughs> thought that far. Um, but yes, at least I should. Um, I should give one or two typical example questions, I suppose, so you understand how the exam can look like. Yeah. 
because this lecture is quite conceptual and we went through a lot of material. Maybe I will also try to constrain the material a little bit so that it is not too overwhelming. Okay, good. So then uh, see you again on Wednesday when we continue with uh, Bayesian optimal experimental design. Uh, see you until then.